So my affiliation is with the math department, but I'm also affiliated with ICME, and it's, a fan, it's an absolutely unique program. It's absolutely wonderful, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, what I want to talk about today is big data, and I want to argue, first of all, that big data is a misnomer. The big problem, the main problem, is not the size of the data. It can be an issue, but basically we know how to solve it. There are ways to approach it. The real problem, uh, in my view, is complexity in various forms, that the data is actually complex. Even very small data sets can exhibit complexity that make them hard to analyze and hard to derive uh, information and knowledge from them. And this complexity comes in many forms. So it might come, for example, in the form that the input format is difficult, free text, for example, or uh, databases of molecules. But the data set itself could also have some structural complexity, which is what we'll talk about here. And that requires an organizing principle. Um, so the organizing principle that we're all about is uh, the data has shape, and the shape matters. The shape uh, is the first thing you want to know about your data. It's the overall organization. Sometimes it's the only thing you need to know. It gives you the insight that you really need to go further. Other times, of course, you need to do other kinds of a more subtle analysis. I claim everybody in the room actually already knows this fact uh, because everybody has done this problem right here, uh, done or taught or whatever, um, uh, regression line. And when you can do that, it's an extremely powerful thing. When the data actually is well approximated by a line or a plane, an algebraic object, you're in great shape because you can predict one variable in terms of another. There are many things that become possible. Uh, and notice what it is. It is approximating data by a shape. In this case, a very simple shape, that of a straight line. And if all data agreed to lie along lines, we'd be in great shape and we'd be, we'd be all done. However, we often find data that looks like this. Um, so here, no straight line will fit that, but there's an obvious structure here. It breaks into three distinct groups. Oftentimes, those are dis conceptually distinct within the data. And here, too, there is a different kind of shape that one can approximate with. In this case, approximate by three points. Uh, th for example, think of the centroids of these clusters. So again, we're approximating by a shape, but by a different shape. Uh, and uh, uh, the mathematics that goes with this kind of analysis, called cluster analysis, is quite different, quite distinct from the linear regression analysis that was in the previous slide. Again, if, if, everything, if this covered everything, we'd be happy. Unfortunately, we'd run into data that looks like this, uh, which has its own shape here. It's not the clusters, it's not a line, but it's a loop. This kind of data often occurs when you have data that's undergoing some kind of periodic or recurrent behavior. And I would emphasize recurrent here because it's oftentimes in biology in many places, you know, it's, it's recurrent and not necessarily periodic with a fixed period. Now here we, we could take as our approach here, we could say, okay, here's a new data type or a new structural type. Let's go ahead and uh, build a new math around that, loop detection. Okay. Uh, and we could do that. But we'd be a little bit worried that you know, we'd do that, and then the next thing would, become, you know, would be different, more complicated, and we have to repeat the process. And in fact, that's what happens, because here's another data type, another kind of structure that can occur, occurs frequently. Think, for example, about data coming from sensors from an airliner flying across the country. Uh, you have normal flying at altitude in non-turbulent conditions. That's uh, you know, one, the normal state, which might sit at the middle of that Y. And then three distinct extreme behaviors, which would be landing, takeoff, and uh, flying at altitude but under turbulent conditions, for example. So that, that's how this can arise. And now we look at this, and we really know that we shouldn't be in the business of building models of different kinds of shapes, one after the other. We should build something, some un uniform modeling mechanism that can actually capture all shapes. Um, so how do we model data? Usually when we talk about a model, we mean an algebraic model, and that's what we talked about with the lines and quadratics and so on. But capturing all kinds of shapes, algebra is a little bit too rigid to do that uh, you know, uh, in, in an optimal way. Um, and so I want to talk today uh, briefly about uh, a notion that we call topological modeling. So um, what is topology? Topology is that part of mathematics which studies shape. It's a formalism for measuring and representing shape. We're going to be talking about the representing shape part. It's been part of pure math since the 1700s, but in the last 10 years, it's been ported into what we call the point cloud world, the sampled world, where you don't have complete information, but only some kind of sample from the, the geometric object. 
Um, and so the first paper in this, as I said, is, it's an old subject. This was 1736 in response to a, uh, a recreational math problem. Question was, can you cross all the seven bridges in uh, Königsberg across the river Pregel uh, and crossing each bridge only once? Okay. And the observation that Euler made, who looked at this problem, was it doesn't matter how deep the river is or how wide it is or how long the bridges are or how big the islands are. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is the network that you see there on the right, which represents the two islands with the letters A and D, uh, the two river banks with C and B, and then the connections across. Once he found that simplified representation, it was then easy for him to reason about it and find out that indeed you could not perform that uh, tour. Okay, so the idea is we're going to try to make a similar thing for all kinds of data here. And the way that you do it um, is re related to this situation here, which is uh, a, a, a regular circle. You'll notice it's covered here by three sets. Uh, the blue, which breaks into two components, and the red and the yellow, which um, are single components, and they overlap in the sort of the purple and green sets. So this, the strategy is to do this, uh, create a node for every connected piece of every set in the covering. And now, whenever any two of those components overlap, draw an edge between them, like that. And now you'll notice we've recovered that circle. We've lost some detail, but actually we often don't care about detail. In fact, we don't believe the detail many times because it it's, uh, um, comes out of the noise. And so here we have something that is a representation of that shape um, you know, pretty effectively and done in a systematic fashion. Here's the data version of that. Here, taking connected components has to be done using cluster analysis. You never cluster the whole data set, only pieces of it. Um, so here is a, a real-life example. Um, the, Margot mentioned the, the company. Uh, our company has uh, about 300 academic collaborators, uh, all of whom work on many different problems. In this case, this is a group at Mount Sinai, the Joel Dudley group at Mount Sinai, who are working on type 2 diabetes. They have a data set, a large data set, both from the point of view of rows and columns. So there are many features in this data and also many patients. Um, and um, the network that I'm showing you here is how that data set decomposes. And you can see here it's, it's three pieces connected by thin wires. And it turns out that those three pieces are very, very interesting. So one of them is the standard uh, uh, type 2 diabetes that we think about uh, with obesity and uh, the high blood sugar and you know, all the standard uh, uh, things that we think of. The other two, though, are different forms of uh, diabetes. The one is connected to neurological symptoms, and the other is connected to cancer. Now, what's interesting about this is that Everybody in medicine knows that you need to do precision medicine. You want to start doing precision medicine, ideally get to personalized medicine. But if you want to do uh, precision medicine, at least, you need to have this kind of information. Because if you know that the thing that we thought of as one disease, type 2 diabetes, in fact is three separate diseases with you know, different causes, perhaps, and maybe different treatments, you need to know that fact. And so this is sort of a very important uh, uh, discovery. Um, Another group of collaborators uh, at Stanford here, the um, uh, David Schneider group, is studying uh, the infectious disease, progression of infectious disease, trying to study what happens as you get sick, and then as you get sicker, and then ultimately your body starts to respond, and then you return to a healthy state. Um, and so the finding here is that in many contexts, both with mice and humans, malaria and flu, various uh, different diseases, you will always get, as you might expect here, a loopy model because you start out at a place, you go out and become sicker, but as you return and get healthy, you don't go along the same trajectory. Uh, and so here's what, you, what, what, what comes out, but what's very important about this is precisely what I mentioned about recurrence versus periodicity. Because, in fact, in this case, the time variable is not a good indicator for where you are in the process of healing. That will vary a great deal from subject to subject. But what this provides is an invariant description, a description of what is your actual state in terms of physiological measurements and also genomic measurements. So this allows them to get at study of function in a much more effective, effective way. 
Um, and just to give you an, another circle model, as you might expect, the business cycle also gets reflected in this way. So this describes here that, you know, a, a data set consisting of a large vector of economic indicators, and one can follow it over a number of years and see that it does provide this loopy behavior. You will notice, though, that there are some anomalies down at the bottom. One of those big anomalies is, uh, you know, primarily concentrated in 2007, 2008, as one might, one might expect. And the point is you can now actually draw out and see where are you as you go along the timestamp. And you can see here there's a movement from purple to blue to green to yellow to purple to blue to green to yellow, but it happens at much different uh, time intervals. Okay, and do I have, I have two or three more minutes? Yeah. Um, so finally I found this was an analysis I, I did just out of interest. There's a um, survey that's been carried out. Um, actually over the last 30 years, they've done seven or eight different iterations on it. Uh, and it's called the World Value Survey. People are asked questions about things that are nominally values related. That is to say, somehow related perhaps to politics, but perhaps also to faith and religion and, and, and other things. Um, so it's done in many countries. I took the US uh, respondents, of which there were about 2,000. And so the network looks like this. This is the topological model of this network. And you can interrogate the model very easily. Um, and you can see that actually the, the, the bottom group, uh, let me say the far left group here uh, on the far left, consists of people who have elevated trust in institutions quite generally. So they trust, uh, you know, government. Uh, they trust uh, the universities. They also trust the police and the church, although perhaps not as highly as is done in some other parts of the network. Um, the lowest part, the part at the bottom, is people who have trust in three institutions, and those three institutions are the police, the military, and the church. As you go over to the far right, you will see that then there is trust in exactly one institution, which is the church. Again, this is a cartoon version, but this is roughly speaking what happens. And at the very top, you have people who have, just don't trust institutions at all. Now, what's interesting is you can do the same kind of modeling that we would do with physics here on this social science uh, kind of uh, analysis now because you can now color by other questions. So in this case, one question in the questionnaire here, which was not used in building the network, uh, the network was a trust in institutions, but this one says, do you have right or left preference on a scale of 1 to 10? And as you can see, that's colored. So the heavy bottom part is the right people on the right, the conservative, the people in the upper left are the liberal. You can also color by the aggregate trust in institutions, the sum of the trust in all possible institutions. And then that turns out to be colored this way. So what you find then is the part and group in the upper right um, trusts uh, institutions very little. The part in the lower left have more trust than, than, uh, in, in, than, than you might otherwise think. So that's uh, two different coordinates, independent coordinates, right to left status and also um, uh, trust in institutions. And so there are also, though, some questions that aren't obviously political, which nevertheless give some interesting insight here. So uh, questions, do you feel you have control over your life? Not obvious how that would correlate with the trust in institutions, but if you look at it, what you see here is the people who don't trust the institutions at the very top um, also don't feel they have control over their lives. The group at the bottom who trust the military and the church and the police um, you know, have a much higher degree of control over their lives. This one particular question acts as the Y coordinate. Um, another one, and there are some controversial questions in this survey, is should employers favor native-born employees in difficult economic times? Obviously sort of a controversial, really serious values type question. Uh, and you can see here that where that goes, the people on the left disagree with that question, the way the color scheme works, uh, you know, that it, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, they don't believe that. The people on the right, in particular, the very heavily religious people on the right, um, uh, you know, ha more, have more agreement with that question. And then just a final confirmation of that, a question that would appear related would be, how much trust do you have in the United Nations? And indeed, you can look at it and you can see that it also has this uh, right to left uh, behavior.